God bless you, family. I thank God for each of you that are faithful, who are always being a part of what's going on at AGC. Thank you for being an audience for the perfecting class. We are very appreciative of you. And again, I know that the, you just have to be special in the eyes of God because you're special in the eyes of the pastor. And I appreciate every, each and every one of you. Grateful. You are just special. You know, there are those who are just unique in their own way. And I think that each of you are. And each of you fall within that category. So we love you and we thank God for you. Now, we're getting ready for perfecting class on this 20th of February. And uh, we will be dealing with the crucif crucifixion and death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to make note of the fact that, you know, you, Easter is not until April, so we've got some time ahead of us. But Pastor is following the, the text that's pre-printed in our little Sunday school quarterly. And it might be a little early, but uh, I'm going to stay with the, the, the path that's already pre-printed. So, like I said, Easter is some time off, especially in, in, in April. And here we are in February talking about the crucifixion and death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're going to stay in touch, in line with what has been uh, given us. Now, our lesson text is John chapter 19. Verse 16 through 30. John 19, verse 16 through 30. I want you to also get a chance. Mark 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. The golden text is when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That's John chapter 19, verse 30. Now, today's aim is to study John's account of the crucifixion of Jesus, the King of the Jews. The principle is to become wholly assured that Jesus died on the cross to take away the sins of the world. The application is to determine to live in victory over sin because Christ's death has set us free. Amen. So, as we think about where we are, and what Christ has done for us, we can live a life of freedom. Sin has no longer dominion over us. All right, let us have a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful, thankful again for this gathering together of your elect, your children, your people. We pray, Lord, for your wisdom and divine guidance. Precious Holy Spirit, teach us. So we study your word, we seek your guidance, and we seek your direction. We acknowledge you right now, and you take control in Jesus' name. Now, our scripture text begins at John chapter 19, beginning at verse 16. John 19, verse 16. And we're going to go all the way to the 30th verse. And it reads as follows. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And keep in mind, I just want to reiterate that Jesus has already been scourged and beaten. He's been flogged. His back is raw and open and he's bleeding. And so it, 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 the text doesn't go into detail, but now he's being delivered unto the people to be crucified. Verse 17. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, and where they crucify him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, 
write not the king of the Jews, but, said, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. And now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sisters, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Verse 26, And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge in, with vinegar, vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. All right, let us jump right into to the studying of the text. John 19, chapter 19, verse 16 to the 22nd verse. When Pilate threatened him with death, Jesus reminded him that any power Pilate had over him was delegated from above. Isn't that awesome? So Pilate is, is boasting of himself. Pilate is letting him know that, hey, I'm the head man in charge. Uh, you Don't you know that I have the power to do this and the power to do that? And Jesus, I love it, allowed Pilate, Pilate, Pilate to realize that you would have no authority. You have no rightful authority over me except it had already been delegated from above. So what you're doing is simply playing uh, along with what God has intended to be. So yes, you are king, and yes, you you have all your your royalty and your living in this big beautiful palace and everything. But understand something. Let's get something straight. I am king of kings, and I am lord of lords. And the only reason you're able to execute any authority over me is because it has been delegated by my heavenly Father. I love that. Amen. Amen. I love that. And so he said, and that the greater sin was therefore upon the Jewish authorities who were misappropriating Pilate's civil power to murder him. At this, Pilate desperately tried to release Jesus, but the religious leaders insinuated that such an action would be tantamount to treason against Caesar. So they literally had Pilate's hands tied. They said, if you release this man, you, 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 are, you are literally committing treason against Caesar. Now, Pilate did not want to be uh, accused of being uh, treacherous, against, uh, especially against you know, Caesar. So literally, his being somewhat backed into a corner, they're telling Pilate, if you release this man, then that's just the same as treason against Caesar Augustus. And Pilate, he relented, he gave in, and for them that, in giving them the order for Jesus to be crucified. You know, he, he knew the right thing to do, but he gave in anyway. So think about that. But still, all that they were doing, all the religious leaders, and, and even Pilate himself, were all part of a master plan that God has. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, real quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, very, very quickly. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. 
Now understand that God always has a plan. He's always orchestrating things. It's, it's known as the sovereignty of God. So e even the powers that be are ordained of God, the word teaches us. And look what it said now. As we get ready to go further, we're ready to go back to John. But right now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 says, None of the princes of this world knew what they were actually doing. They did not know that they were part of a sovereign plan of God. You know, so sometimes we have to be very careful, too. We can't uh, just look at where we are or what we're going through and come to a total conclusion about our lives or our situation. No. Where we are is simply a part or a piece of the whole. It is not the whole. So don't let ever let the devil convince you that, you know, where you are, what you're going through, what you're suffering, what, you, what you're, you're being exposed to, oh, that's the totality of your life. No. Uh-uh. God is sovereign. And he does have a way of taking everything that we go through and everything we experience. And he does. It is so true. He has a way of working that out together for our good. But here's an interesting point also to realize about God's sovereignty. Here, everyone is happy. The, the religious leaders are happy. Pilate is concerned. He's washed his hands. His wife has told him that she had a dream about this man. You should leave this man. Uh, you don't, don't convict him. But he's given in. So Pilate think about simply by the fact of using some water that he can wash the blood off his hands, off this innocent man's hand. But no, water won't wash away that blood stain. No, sir, Pilate. But anyway, even though Pilate was reluctant, he, he gave in, he relented to their request, he did not realize that he was still part of an overall plan that God had. And 1 Corinthians 2, 8 says, none of the princes of this world knew. No one knew the overall panoramic plan that God had. They did not know. They was not aware of it. For look what it says. For had they known, now had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had known that by crucifying Jesus, by executing this plan, they thought they were getting rid of Jesus, not knowing that they were uh, executing a plan that would release the Holy Spirit upon this planet. God is awesome. So always remember, God has a plan. Even though it, it looks, you know, like Jesus is defeated, looks like he's lost, he's been beaten, he's been flogged. We see that our Heavenly Father always, he always has a plan. And a lot of times... Those of this world, they're not privy. They don't know a clue of what's going on. So even in our current situation, in our current season that we're going through, even as God's children, don't you ever forget, He, God, has a plan. So I just want to lose that little insert from 1 Corinthians 2 and 8. All right, going back to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19, verse 16 and 18. Now the place of of execution was known as Golgotha or Calvary. Both words mean skull. The place may have been so named because it was a place of death and the image of a skull often symbolizes death. Two criminals were also crucified along with Jesus fulfilling Isaiah. He made his grave with the wicked and he was numbered with the transgressors. Wow. So, so we get that picture that you, most of us see where Jesus is in the center and on to the left and to the right, there are these other individuals who are crucified along with him. Now, these criminals at once also mocked Jesus, but one of them had a change of heart and was ultimately ushered into Christ's kingdom upon his death. One of them said this, and you know the famous prayers. He said, Lord, just remember me when thou come into thy kingdom. And Jesus said something so powerful. 
to the point where one of these thieves made it into heaven. He said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Isn't that awesome? So the place of heaven is described as Jesus as a place known as paradise. And that thief that repented, that thief that had a change of heart, was 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 basically escorted into heaven, into a place called paradise, where Jesus would be. So just that last minute. Now some people don't think of deathbed decisions. Yes, it doesn't matter when you come. It doesn't matter how you get there, as long as you make it in. And some people will say that's not fair. I've lived the Christian life all my life, and here's this thief. On his deathbed, knowing he can't go anywhere else, knowing that he's facing death, has the right to just walk on into heaven. That's right. God is a merciful God. And he tells us a story about a gentleman who came to work. And the, the owner of the field told him, if you he started in the morning, if you work, I'm going to give you a penny. The guy came at noontime. He said, if you want to work, I give you a penny. You know, one guy came at the end of the day, just before they closed, he also received what was equivalent to a penny day's work. And the one who came that morning was a little upset. He said, wait a minute, you know, we done worked all day through this, and you give him the same that you given me, the same wage? And he just clocked in at, at 4.55 and clocked out, out at 5 o'clock. So Jesus said, yes, it does not matter. And it's representation, and it represents the same thing. It does not matter. Some person may live all their life doing what they want to do, and on their deathbed, ask God to save them, and he will. He is a merciful and loving God. All right, John chapter 19, verse, verses 19 to 22. Now, since the crucifixions were carried out in public, a placard was often placed on the cross of the condemned person to identify the criminal and the crime for which he was being executed. This was usually for, for inspiring fear into the populace rather than for merely informational purposes. So think of a plaque or something, or, 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 or a little plaque or, or board or whatever, that they can put over each individual who was crucified. Since the Jewish leaders had convinced Pilate to execute Jesus because he claimed to be the king of the Jews, Pilate had that title inscribed on his cross so that anyone would be able to understand what was written. The inscription was presented in three languages, Aramaic, the language was spoken by most Jews at this time, usually known as Hebrew, to Greeks and to Romans, Latin, the official language of the Roman Empire, and Greek, the universal language of the known world. Now the chief priests were highly indignant about the inscription. They wanted Pilate to change the message to say that Jesus only claimed to be the king of the Jews. But Pilate was no longer in a mood to accommodate the Jewish leaders and so he refused to give their request by, by any consideration. He told them, basically, what I have written, I have written. He just said, no more accommodations. All right, John 19, verse 23 to 24. It was a common practice at this time for those on the death detail to simply divide the clothing and other personal possessions of the condemned among themselves. And the condemned was usually crucified naked. Think about that. The, the condemned was usually crucified naked, adding to their public humiliations. There were four soldiers at the cross, so most of Jesus' clothing was parceled out among them in four ways. But they were still left with Jesus, a coat or a tunic, which was woven in one piece with no seams. Rather than tear this garment into four ruined rags, the soldiers decided on gambling to see who would get the whole garment. Especially how they did this is not stated. But it's probably involved something like the rolling of dice 
like many other seemingly ordinary actions surrounded Jesus' life and death, what the soldiers did unintentionally fulfilled prophecy. So what they did, you know, here we go again. Had they known, that here they are, you know, rolling something similar to dice or whatever, casting lots for it, not even knowing that they, they are still fulfilling scriptures that have been written hundreds and hundreds of years before they were even born. So it's all coming together. God has a master plan. Yes, God has a master plan. So even the soldiers, here they are thinking, man, let's not tear the garment. Uh, but let's cast lots for it so that whoever wins, wins the whole piece. So think about that. And something else to reflect upon also is this, is that the anointing that was in his clothing and on his clothing that was no longer there because there's no reference of them actually speaking of once they was touching his clothes that there was any response. So think about that. Now, there was a woman who came behind him and touched his clothes, remember? And she didn't touch his body. She touched just a hem of his garment and she was made whole of an issue of blood that she had for 12 long years. But now, at this moment, I just want to bring that note, that point to consider that the anointing has left his clothing. So what they're actually getting is just an ordinary piece of woven uh, tunic or coat. All right. Provisions of rains. John 19, verse 25 through 27. Now, while the chosen followers largely forsook Jesus after his arrest, there were some disciples who remained faithful during that time. Among them were certain women who stood near his cross. Jesus' own mother, Mary, stood there as her eldest son, Jesus, had a special responsibility to take care of his mother. Though he would soon rise from the dead, his time on earth was nearly over. He therefore made provisions for Mary's needs in his absence. The disciple whom Jesus loved has traditionally been understood as reference to the author of the fourth gospel, the apostle John himself. It's in fact, it refers to someone else. We have no clue who that might have been. But the disciple whom John loved has often, often referred to John, the gospel writer of, of, of St. John himself. When Jesus said to Mary, Behold thy son. He was telling her she should not think of John as her son. He would be taking his place. Then when he said to John, Behold thy mother. He was likewise telling John he should now consider Mary his mother. It was a means whereby Jesus could be assured that Mary would be cared for after his death, since it seems evident that Joseph had been deceased for some time at this point. Wow. So Jesus is ensuring. He's making sure that mom is taken care of. And we think of jo uh, Joseph's earthly father, Jesus' earthly father, that is, which was Joseph. Uh, he's nowhere in the picture. So it's rightfully assumed that he has passed or he's been deceased. But he's making sure that mom being a widow would be taken care of. And he's placing her, his mom, in the hands of his closest friend, John who was the writer of this gospel. And the statement from that hour that the disciple took her onto his own home explains Jesus' purpose in making these declarations to them from the cross. Taking responsibility for his mother's welfare as he hung on the cross shows us that even in untold agony and on the verge of death, Jesus kept his father's commandments perfectly. Even at this most dire moment, when we might expect him to be preoccupied with his own suffering. He was faithful to do his father's will in making provisions for his bereaved mother as any dutiful son would do. So think about this. With nails through his palms of his hands, with nails through both feet, he's up there on the cross, bloodshot eyes, bike has been shredded with with the flogging, he's bleeding profusely. Great drops of blood has a thorn, a crown of thorns upon his head. But yet, he's 
coherent enough to pause and take care of a special lady called mother. Yes, isn't that something? This is why moms are just special. If we see it even in the life of Jesus, mom, how special you are. So even disregarding his own suffering and his own pain, he made sure that mom was provided for even in his absence. Mission accomplished. John chapter 19, verse 28 and verse 30. As best as we can determine, Jesus was on the cross from about 9 in the morning until about 3 in the afternoon. These were the very hours during which sacrifices were made in the temple. As the Lamb of God, Jesus was taking away the sins of the world on the cross through the perfect once-for-all sacrifice of himself. All the prophecies related to his sacrificial death were being fulfilled these hours of regular daily sacrifice. Everything is falling into line. Indeed, all things were now accomplished. And knowing that all was accomplished, Jesus fulfilled one more prophecy by declaring aloud the terrible thirst he experienced on the cross. Psalm 69 verse 21 says, They gave me also a gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Vinegar of that era was a cheap wine, vinegar commonly consumed by soldiers. When mixed with other substances, it was used as an anesthetic. Hyssop is also known as Syrian Orient Gano. It, it is an herb used both as seasoning and also in religious rituals. Here it was a long branch of bunch of hyssop that had a sponge attached to it. And it was used to offer a drink to Jesus to, to, to basically quench his thirst, perhaps even making it possible for him to forcefully make his final declaration. John 19 through verse 30, powerful three words, it is finished. And after receiving the wine, vinegar, Jesus declared, it is finished. Now notice he didn't say it is over. Notice he didn't say it is done. He said it is finished. In other words, it is complete. A single word in the original language. The term was often used as a completion of a contract, as when a debt was paid in full. Glory to God. Jesus shouted, Tetelestai. It is finished. Everything I've come to do, everything I've come to achieve, my mission is complete. He's simply saying, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Far from being an admission of defeat, it is finished is an affirmation of victory. Jesus' redemptive work to save the lost sinners was now fully accomplished. Mission accomplished. From the standpoint of the rest of the New Testament, what Christ did on the cross is a finished work. Nothing can be added to it. My Lord, it is a finished work. Nor can anything be taken away from it. Though unworthy of his grace, we can receive salvation through faith in Christ. Though we are unworthy of his grace, we have now been brought into right relationship. We've been justified. And we can receive saving grace through our faith in Christ. And having completed his work on the earth, Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost that he, that is, he died. So first of all, we see the process. He finished his work first. Then he bowed his head next, all right, and gave up the ghost, all right. He was still in control even at the moment of death. Work is complete. My work is finished. So he, here he is. He bows his head. And he gives up the ghost. My God is still in charge. Even at the moment of death. And to confirm that Jesus was indeed dead. Soldiers pierced his side with the spear. Fulfilling the prophecy. They shall look on him whom they pierce. This is in Zechariah 12.10. Had he not already expired. They would have broken his legs to hasten his death. 
Now, if Jesus had not expired, if he had not already dead, the, the custom is to break his legs. But here we go again. Even this prophecy is being fulfilled. Say, a bone of him shall not be broken. This is Psalms 34 and verse 20. Isn't that? So, so if Jesus, when they came upon Jesus, if he was still alive, they would have broke his legs. But here, everything, my Lord. Can't you see the sovereignty of God? Can't you see how everything that God had, the word has been spoken, is falling into place? Like pieces of a puzzle all coming together to paint a picture that God is in control. Some may look at Jesus as a defeated foe. They might look at Jesus as, wow, you lost. You've been defeated. But not knowing, behind the scene, a sovereign God is working and orchestrating everything that all the scriptures would be fulfilled. Thank God for Tetelestai. Thank God for the fact that it is finished. Not over, but finished. Everything has been complete. All we have to do is accept our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we are guaranteed a place in heaven, a place in eternity, a place with the Father. And to that, all glory and honor and all majesty belongs to our Heavenly Father. We can say to our Savior Jesus, thank you, Lord, for paying an awesome price for someone like ourselves. You gave us something, Lord, we didn't deserve and something we could never earn. And that is salvation through faith in you. We love you and we thank you. Family, this has been a good lesson. Uh, like I said, you know, it's, it's dealing with Jesus' crucifixion and his death. And we know that Easter is still a ways off. But we're just following the guidelines and, and, and what's already printed in our quarterly Sunday school lesson. So to God be the glory, to God be the praise. But I want you to just pause and reflect and think about it. Jesus paid an awesome price for us. He died for us. The least we can do is live for him and honor him with a life. Paul said something very powerful in Hebrews. Let us therefore offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to Christ. A living sacrifice. Hallelujah. To God be the glory and to God be the praise. So thank you again. You are special. And pastors say that, and I mean that. You are special. If you didn't show up to hear perfecting class, that would be one less to hear the lesson. But thank you for putting in the time and the effort. Thank you for so much. Thank you for just being you. You are special. Love you, and God bless.